share and share alike. That's what our parents taught us. So it's high time we take that message to the world of data, and it's happening right now. Data exchanges are really taking off as companies share data about products, trends, transactions, you name it. The future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed. Yet, today's world teams with innovation. The nexus of hardware, software, and human ingenuity promises a revolution in possibilities. What does tomorrow look like? Witness Future Proof. Things are white hot. Goodness gracious. The topic for today is fantastic, I have to say. Uh, sharing is caring. The rise of data exchanges. These things have been around for, for quite some time now, a number of years for sure, but it's really taking off. There's a company called Snowflake that's obviously pushing the envelope on that, but they're not the only ones. There are lots of data exchanges cropping up all around, and it's really cool stuff. So people can exchange data to better understand products, services, customers, markets, whatever the case may be. We've got a couple healthcare experts on the call today who are working in that space. So we'll talk about that. But it's an all-star cast. We've got Matt Heelan from Illumisoft. Peter Swanson is calling in from uh, Pieces and Bowtie BI. We've got uh, Brian Platts from Flurry, and of course, my good buddy Bruno Aziza from Google. And Looker is on the call today. So let's just dive right in, folks. Data exchanges are very powerful because you can understand what your partners are doing, right? I mean, in the old days, we did all sorts of ETL, that's called extract, transform, load. We just sort of heavy lift, forklift data into systems here and there to be able to get a better understanding of again, customers, prospects, products, whatever the case may be. But now if you can share data from a central repository and all see the same data, then you can work from the same page basically. So there are lots and lots of use cases for this, lots and lots of ways you can get it done. And it's a fast moving marketplace, folks. I gotta tell you, this space is so, so hot these days. I was on a call last night with Databricks. They're doing their big summit today. And uh, I looked them up and yes, indeed, they just raised about a billion dollars, a billion dollars. And this is about what, 10 years now, not quite eight or seven years after Cloudera really shook things up by getting a $740 million investment from Intel. Of course, they're still around. They're still kicking their note nowhere near as big as they used to be in the market. I mean, the market cap, I think of Cloudera is like 2 billion. I just looked it up. And uh, the, the assessed valuation of Databricks is now $28 billion. Holy Christmas. And of course, Snowflake had the biggest IPO ever. So data is everywhere, folks. And AI uses data. AI really needs data to train models. And uh, that's kind of a big deal. So we'll talk about all that today on the show. So Matt Heelan, I'll throw you in first from Illumisoft. Tell us a bit about data exchanges and how you're working in that space. Yeah, so... Um... So I guess to start off with, I guess Illumisoft is a, a custom software development company. Uh, we're based in Kansas City, Missouri, and our main uh, we specialize mainly in healthcare. Um, and uh, I describe the company kind of this way in that, you know, we try to, we love working in healthcare because it challenges our minds and it fulfills our hearts. Um, and so a lot of the projects that we get involved in are on the clinical side, it's on the research side as well. And as that pertains to data sharing, I would just, one project would probably highlight uh, that in a really effective way um, on the research side, at least. Um, we uh, participate in a clinical study of about a thousand uh, individual people um, that are where we're studying uh, the impact of glucose on, uh, or the impact of exercise on glucose. And as a part of that, um, project, we are collecting data from, um, I don't know, it's probably up as or 10, 10 or so different sources and devices and collecting all that data um, is going to be, then be given to a research team so that they can publish a report about, about um, you know, what, what the study is telling us and what the data is telling us. Um, the great thing about research data gathering is, um, you know, there is this urge for us to be able to share that data with other researchers, right, in a way that, that we can all begin to kind of benefit from that. But there's also some risk associated with and there's some uh, regulatory hurdles sometimes to, to um, overcome. But, you know, overall, you know, the positive outcomes that we see are, you know, we're advancing medical research quickly. We're, we're helping to understand disease faster. We think that 
It's going to translate to faster drug development, personalized treatment, patient safety, you know, all those different things is, is what the hope, the outcome of sharing that data, data would actually do. Yeah, well, I've got some history in the healthcare research industry and some of my good pals in that business told me just four or five years ago that it was very difficult to get researchers to share information in part because of how grants are given. And you get this paranoia on the part of researchers that if they share their ideas, someone else is going to take it and get a grant themselves. Do you see that starting to to wane a bit, especially now when we have so much data that is in so many places that is so valuable and it's become pretty obvious that it's a good idea to share that data. Do you see that dynamic changing? Yeah, as a matter of fact, if, uh, if you look up uh, UNESCO's open science movement, um, that's really what um, one of the things that they're they're trying to advance is is this idea of removing research from different silos um, and, and trying to do almost like a um, an open source research. So in other words, we're encouraging people to be more collaborative with their research and not be so protective of their their research and their methods, right? And I, I think there's there's going to be a lot of it's going to take a lot of time to kind of change that mentality. But a lot of the physician partners that I'm working with. Um, and that are our clients, they are very open to the idea of that, in, you know, in the advancement of, you know, obviously, you know, children's healthcare is an area that we specialize in. So there's, you know, there's, there's some movement there. So. Well, that's good news, right? And I think the other side of the equation here is artificial intelligence. I kind of teased that at the top of the hour. Databricks is out there talking about how they are the ultimate solution. They've got this concept of a lake house now. And, uh, that facilitates the use of AI technologies, which does make some sense. But to me, the more data you get, you, and of course you want quality data, you don't want garbage in so you get garbage out, but the more we can share and vet data, and I think that's part of the process here, right? When you share, you can vet, because then some other partner can see, hey, you got some data here that I'm not sure is correct, right? It's like with open source technology, many eyes make few the errors, right? One of the, the mantras is that bad code goes away. And I think the more we share, bad data will go away, or at least I hope so. But what do you think about that, Matt? Yeah, I think there's a, I think it's an American Association of Medical Informatics is a group out there. They've created about 10 different um, principles, if you will, of what of what quality data is and, and what we how we manage the, the patient generated data. So I think there's there's more and more framework around uh, how data is collected, shared, and you know, and and administered, if you will. So you know, I would challenge people to go out there and look that up. Um, you, you can learn quite a bit about um, uh, different frameworks that people are trying to put in place for for you know those kinds of things. So yeah, no, that that's good news. Well, it's a good segue to bring in Peter Swanson from Pieces Incorporated and Bowtie BI, and you do a lot of work in uh, in data exchanges as well. Tell us a bit about your company and what you're doing in the world of data exchanges. So Eric, thank you for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk about data with y'all. Um, pieces, so I, I actually joined here recently through an acquisition, mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately our joint company's venture is uh, to promote uh, and help better people's health and well-being. Um, from how do we extract information, I go, kind of going back to the ETL worlds, but uh, ultimately, if we are combining these data sets, we want to improve how we're identifying data points within the clinical setting, but realizing that uh, a full patient's um, pathway includes elements within the community. So how do we securely connect and identify issues within a clinical setting, but then create that closed loop referral to make sure that we actually followed up and address those issues, um, mm -hmm. particular issues in healthcare, such as length of stay or um, readmittance. So if we can identify a barrier why that patient can't be discharged and identify how that can be solved within the community, as well as can we address that issue in the community before they show back up in the emergency department or in the acute uh, clinical setting, there's a lot of value there. But it requires us to look uh, at multiple different systems, share data uh, from that perspective. So really for um, from the, uh, the bow tie side and as we join pieces, what we really became experts in was how do we connect these to pair, uh, desperate sources, oftentimes they're not even in um, you know, a cloud-based solution. So how do we collect it from anything from a flat file all the way up to API integrations, joining that and kind of controlling the flow of data from that perspective. And that's where architecture really comes into play, right? I mean, I, I've seen this myself 
one of the questions I would ask on this show 13 years ago is with the data quality initiative, how do you avoid overriding good data with bad? Because some of the technologies, well, they're fairly dated and it's hard to know. I mean, anyone who, who thinks that data quality is good, just take a hard look at your own data, your own corporate data, bring up some spreadsheet and you start browsing around and you're gonna find bad data everywhere. I mean, it's really, it's uh, it's an issue. It causes all kinds of problems and especially in healthcare. I mean, goodness gracious, that's when you get all kinds of problems. But talk about the architecture of a solution like this and how you help to ensure that you're mitigating mistakes and optimizing quality. Absolutely. So we kind of look at different data pipelines because every single source is going to have a different structure, a different a cadence of how they're syncing data. So when we talk about interoperability, I, I would like to take a step back here. Is there's two parts of it. There's one is the standard or what are we trying to, to look at from a stand, how we're going to standardize this data. And we talk about data quality. And then two, the technical side of how we're actually going to logistically connect these data sources together. And in there, you know, we have a bunch of tools and resources that are available, including within our company and also just out there uh, in general in the marketplace that allow us to accomplish the technical side. But it's important to understand where we're, what's that standard. Um, and another part is how do we incorporate that into the actual workflow? So if the source is bad, how do we improve the source of collection? Um, and if we can reduce the time and the experience from the people collecting this information, we improve the accuracy um, and really eliminate the need or reduce the need for a translation work after the fact. And yeah, that's important stuff. And, and uh, to your point, if we're all able to, to see the shared data, then again, we can all kind of chime in and offer perspective on what's happening. I mean, I, I remember I had this sort of epiphany, gosh, it's almost 20 years ago, I guess, about federal spending. And I thought to myself, why can't Americans see exactly precisely where all the money goes? because there's a system that cranks out payments. And if you just, you know, siphon off that data, we should be able to see where the money is actually going. And then of course, some crazy things happened and they actually passed some legislation. But the idea, I actually got the idea when there's a guy from a university, I think in, in the Midwest somewhere, the last time that Osama bin Laden gave a public address, he thought he was in the middle of nowhere and no one could figure out where he was. But there was a geologist who actually recognized the rock formation behind him and said, aha, there's only two places in the world where you're going to find a rock face like that. And there are those places. And like all of a sudden we're hot on the trail of the world's biggest bad guy because of data sharing, because someone knew of that. So the idea is that if you give everyone who is a, a stakeholder visibility into the data and give them the, the capacity to see it and to comment on it, you can slowly root out the errors. And, and to your point, get the pipelines nice and clean. And, and especially if we stop making so many copies of data, right? I think that's one of the, the issues is that there's a study in fact that came out just recently that said most data in large organizations gets copied up to like seven, eight times. So think about the data quality issues, think about, yeah, I mean, just the storage cost issues, but the inefficiencies in that model. And I think increasingly we're gonna be able to leverage exchanges and other corporate data and not have to constantly be making extracts and ETL and all that kind of fun stuff. But what are your thoughts on that, Peter? Absolutely. I, you know, the redundancy comes from you know the desire to store and, and centralize this data, and also that we don't trust necessarily a lot of the sources or we have multiple sources. Right. So if we go back and actually solve the core root of why we're getting bad data or why those pipelines are bad, and the uh, the evolution of data exchanges, it reduces the need to have that. So if we trust one particular source and we can join them together securely and safely, we re reduce the need to actually have that redundancy, which also causes confusion in the translation. So I, I, I agree. And you know, if we can improve the point of collection, um, as well as how we safely secure this, it really reduces the burden down. Yeah, may, I mean, many eyes make few the errors, right? Many hands make light the work, basically. And again, if we get these trusted repositories, and I think you you use the buzzword there, trust, right? People don't trust data. I've heard stories of companies that will have an enterprise data warehouse that was built specifically because they didn't trust the data coming from some other department. <laughs> so they're out there building their own warehouse. You're getting their own version of the truth because they don't believe what their other department in their organization is saying. And that's, you know, that's a disaster that's happening all the time. What do you think, Peter? Absolutely. And then every iteration you go beyond that, you lose sight of what actually is the truth. So from a concept of how do we touch data once, but then how do we accurately link that together to get inside? So I always look at everyone wants to analyze data. 
but it's an element of how do we collect and how do we store that that allows us to efficiently analyze that. Talking all things data exchanges, great conversation already. And next up, Brian Platts of a company called Flurry, that's F-L-U-R dot E-E on the interwebs. Very, very interesting company, very interesting play. Uh, Brian, tell us a bit about your technology and what you're doing in the space of data exchanges. Great. Well, thanks for having me, uh, Eric. So yeah, Flurry is an open source technology and it's really designed to help power data ecosystems. So address some of these challenges around data exchanges, which we call the many to many problems. So most databases and data management technology is uh, has to only deal with a one-to-one. -one. There's only one thing updating the data. There's only one thing reading the data, which is an application in front of it. But many-to-many -many means in an ecosystem, you have many things updating data, many things reading data, and it introduces a lot of challenges. We address this with a, a, a semantic graph database that exists independently from a distributed ledger that holds basically RDF data. So you can sort of scale these databases anywhere in the world. And they have a lot of uh, really core capabilities to address some of the challenges we've heard Matt talk about and Peter talk about as far as how do you, you know, actually interconnect data automatically without ETL, how do you lock in time and happy to get into some of that with you. Yeah, so RDF, very interesting concept in the semantic world has been around for a long time, triples, we call them and semantics is this very interesting space that like I say, it's been around for 25 or, or 30 years or so in some tangible form. There've been a couple of semantics winters, I suppose, after the hype came up and then it went back down. But I, I think uh, just like AI, the time for semantics is now. And semantics really helps you navigate through massive amounts of content and material and make sense of it, right? Through ontologies, for example. But through semantics, you can, you can kind of structure what is typically unstructured data, at least to a certain degree. Is that about right, Brian? Yeah, and you can certainly wrap it around structured data as well, but it allows you to uniquely identify data such that data can point to other data that doesn't have to exist in the same repository. So, you know, it really mimics the World Wide Web. We have a bunch of web pages. They're run by independent parties, but they can link to each other and us humans can navigate them. The semantic data web does the same thing for machines and data. It can link to different repositories and uh, connect machines automatically with their information. I agree the time is now. I always like to reflect that, you know, the, the core of the internet was invented in about 1965. So that took about 30 or so years wow. for it to kind of take <laughs> off. So, uh, but yeah, I think now is the time for this technology. Yeah, and RDF stands for Resource Description Framework for any of those out there keeping score at home. And uh, what I think is really interesting is that the world is, as you suggest, is so distributed these days. It is so heterogeneous. And I think we went down this really interesting path over about 25 to 30 years of trying to consolidate data into a data warehouse, for example, into one place where we could all kind of make sense of it. But now with the array of technologies as mature as they are, we don't have to do that anymore. And to your point with this technology, you can kind of, you can give some context and some meaning and a framework for what is otherwise very unwieldy data. And if you can't wield data, you can't use data. Is that about right, Brian? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we contrast um, what we usually call a data centric architecture, which is what we promote with an application centric architecture, which is really what we've been building for 40 years. And the data warehouses and the data lakes are really, I, I think, a side effect of uh, a whole bunch of data silos, of course. Whereas if the, you know, a more data centric approach were taken to begin with, we actually wouldn't have those challenges or have to cram all the data together. Right. Um, yeah, and I think our new dependence on data and how strategic it's becoming to companies means that, you know, companies need to rethink how they get better leverage out of their information. Yeah, that's, this is interesting. So you brought up a really good point, which is that some of these structures are side effects of bad architectures. Well, maybe not bad, but just inefficient architectures. And the fact is that so many things have changed now that we don't have to live in that old world. You know, I, we talk about this a lot on these different shows. There are all these old mindsets for how to do things and they're built around the constraints of yesterday. Things like slow processors, expensive storage, all that stuff, on-prem data centers. I mean, think about the, just the political 
nightmare that many data centers turned into because they're just difficult to manage and they're difficult to predict. And so the people who run them want to make sure they run properly and they don't want to take on too much. I mean, a lot of those constraints go out the window when you leverage the cloud, right? So what's happened is we've had a sea change in terms of the computational infrastructure for data in our world, but we're only you know, in, in small boats maybe going across the river to try to get to the other side now to leverage that stuff. And, and sometimes you got to kind of throw out a lot of the old tech to embrace the new tech, but that's a hard thing to do. How, how do you, like for your clients, are you typically getting sort of cloud native net new companies who are leveraging this or are you getting some of the old guard who realize that they need to change their ways? Well, there's some old guard that are very data centric or deal with very data centric uh, industries, but it's always going to be newer to, you know, target new initiatives. And we have certainly found that to uh, solve this kind of many to many problem, you need to address things differently at the data tier, like uh, trust and provenance that was already brought up. If you're sharing data, you know, what good is it if the people who are receiving it don't have the ability to know where it originated? Uh, things like security. Normally we encode data security in code in our app server, but if we have a data centric view, data has to be able to defend itself, meaning that the data permissions need to be co-resident with the data itself. Uh, in concepts like time, how can two companies collaborate with data if the world's constantly getting updated from underneath them? So natively here, we need to lock in time. We need to have time travel, the ability to issue queries, reproduce data at historical moments. Those are all things that I don't think a one-to-one -one architecture really ever had to address. Yeah, that's a great point. And being able to roll back. So we hear a lot about time series databases in the world today. And th that's really important because what a relational database, it'll you know just place things wherever. So if you have to add a column of time, the timestamp, so you can do that. But there are special databases being built to, to focus on that. Because to your point, if you want to understand what happened, you got to be able to recreate the environment to know where it went. And you have to know the providence, you have to know all these different things. Otherwise, you're just kind of guessing, right? And for some things, you don't want to guess, you want to really know, right, Brian? That's right. And in fact, you know, even with the time travel, something that we do is we really make data look like it's uh, uh, Git source code. And if you think about what Git did, is it actually enabled teams to collaborate around software code. It was hard for them to do that ahead of time. And part of it was immutability and being able to roll back changes, et cetera. Well, you need to be able to do the same thing with your data today. You need to be able to branch data and fork data and have other people have branches of that. Um, so these are all sort of the problems that our solution focuses on. Yeah, I love that. Well, last but not least, we've got Bruno Aziza waiting patiently in the wings. I call him the hardest working man in data. Bruno, welcome to the show. Tell us a bit about yourself and what you're doing at Google in this realm of data exchanges. Well, thanks for having me, Eric. And it's always fun to uh, talk with you. Hopefully you can see me well. Yep, we can uh, see. Uh, so I run, uh, I'm, and my name is Bruno Ziza, and uh, for the people that don't know me, it's really easy to find me. My last name reads Warren backwards the same way. So you just Google me and uh, you'll be able to find me. I've been in the world of uh, data analytics forever, and uh, I am uh, now at Google. I was at Microsoft Oracle, and I was involved in three startups, I think, in the world of data analytics. And so I'm excited to talk about data exchanges because there's a lot going on in the industry today, and, and certainly... I always joke and I say, you know, data sharing is data caring. And so I can tell you a little bit more about what I mean by that. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Well, I think a lot of, of what you talked about on the the context is data sharing is not new. And we, we know this, it's, you know, I think it's been around since the 80s or even the 90s where organizations were sharing data. And, you know, the value of sharing data, of course, is, and we talk about here with the healthcare industry is now multiple parties can share data, competitors actually, can collaborate when they use an exchange um, because now they have a safe, uh, neutral platform for sharing information. And organizations in general get a better perspective beyond just the data that they have at, at their own company. In fact, I did a little graphic here. One of my customers sent me this. Hopefully you can see it. I don't know if you can see this big white area here and this uh -huh. little dot here. <laughs> right. This is a, a, a customer of ours at Lloyd's. He sent me this graphic and he said, this dot here is your data. The rest is the world's data. So this is the reason for why sharing data matters is because if, you, if you're if you trying to use data to capture what 
company is, is you have access to focusing on uh, your company's data. And so that's why, uh, you know, sharing data matters. And that's why 92% of executives, according to uh, the Boston Consulting Group, will tell you that they wish their organization would share data uh, more often. Uh, the problem is, I think, according to Gartner, 5% or less than 5% of executives uh, can uh, run data sharing programs efficiently uh, because they can't trust the data. And so we have here something that is not new. We have a huge need in the market, but we're still over the last 25, 30 years have not been able to kind of crack the nut on how can you share data in a way that's scalable, that is secure, that is reliable. It's really, really painful for organizations today. Yeah, and I think you brought up a lot of really good issues here. Um, one, that uh, it's good to share. And I'd like to get into the vetting part, right? Because when I said at the top of the show, if you share data with your partners, you can vet that data because you're going to miss things. Everybody has blind spots. Every organization has blind spots. And sometimes predictions, decisions are made on bad data. And if it's really bad data, then you can make you know, decisions that destroy the business. So I think that one of the real keys here is vetting data. If you have market data, for example, you have a bunch of companies stepping in to look at market data of in financial services, let's say, liquidity, cash amounts, or whatever the case may be, you can get together and find where those blind spots are. And by just closing those gaps, I think you've gone a long way to improving business for everybody, right, Bruno? Yeah, there's a huge issue with not being able to share effectively data. I think you talked about it here. Uh, the data quality is a big problem and you can rely on the community, of course, to vet that the data that you're using is the right one. But I think in general, if you're not using modern platforms for sharing data, you're going to have all types of issues, right? We talked about multiple copies, which are affecting your costs and affecting your agility and affecting your governance processes. When you have multiple copies of data, you never really want to have that. And, and certainly, you know, I would say that relying on the community only to make sure that the data is is of high quality is probably not enough. You probably want to have systems inside your organization that allow you to do that because ultimately garbage in and, and garbage out. So I'm not sure that by saying, hey, getting access to more data is going to help me uh, solve the data quality. I think it's actually something that you really are going to have to manage more effectively. That's why you want platforms that are neutral, independent, in our planet scale so they can enable you to have validation of that data also have that data in real time one of the issues that we haven't talked about yet is it's great to be able to have a central platform but how can you orchestrate for real-time information you know most of the the companies that we work with you know the the speed at which they can make decision really matters and so you can have a platform that allows you to share information but if there's a, a gigantic delay on how that data is is being shared it just won't help you either and so the combination of having a, a scalable platform and the combination of having a platform that is real time i think is is a key requirement for helping organizations make uh, right decisions at the right time with the highest level of fidelity and and quality yeah, and you know there's another um really big development in the data world this that has been brewing for a while and it's this concept of an append only database mm. right or an append only data store because in the old days you would just overwrite the data so you've got a name in there you had it incorrect you overwrite that data and now that original value is gone like it would just disappear but with an append only data strategy you can kind of avoid that because you can roll back in time you can say oh wait we changed it here but actually shouldn't have been changed so just roll that back or or undo the append if you will and to me that's a big deal because now you've kind of solved for that one massive problem which is mistakes that are overwritten what do you think bruno i think you were making the point last time that you know it's not just the time of the request is it's what it's doing to your potential to innovate as an organization right if by the time you get the answer or the data you need you forgot the initial question <laughs> well then you've really kind of lost in the innovation uh, cycle you know the the other thing i think also that's going on in our space is we've been hyper focused on data exchange and i would say that sharing data by itself is not enough we need now to move beyond just sharing the data to actually sharing analytics assets. Great closing comment, folks. Look at these guys up online. Matt Lumisoft, Brian Platts, Fleury, Peter Swanson, Pieces Incorporated, of course, Bruno Aziza, Google. Great show. We'll talk to you next time, folks.